After a hundred days of concentrated work is the light real. Only then is it the fire of spirit. After a hundred days, the light is spontaneous. A point of true positive energy suddenly produces a pearl, just as an embryo forms from the intercourse of a man and a woman. Then you should attend it calmly and quietly. The turning around of the light is the firing process. Hi everyone, welcome again to The Secret of the Golden Flower. So this verse is very profound. In other words, if you try to do this process as a hobby, as a side interest, maybe an hour or two a day, well, of course, it will bring tremendous benefits into your life, but it will not bring you the second body. It will not bring you the mind-made body talked about by the Buddha. So, we have to concentrate our energy. What does that mean? That means we do nothing but cultivate the turning around of the light for a hundred days. hundred days is an approximate value. It happened to me within 60 days, but that's because I had just spent six months with Osho. <laughs> so I had a really good setup. And then I left the ranch, I went home to my place in Portland, and I just sat. That's all I did. I'd get up in the morning and sit. I mean, I still do the same thing today. Get up in the morning and sit, and then have a little breakfast and then sit and maybe take a few breaks now and then, walk around a little bit, go for a walk, come back, sit, have lunch, sit, <laughs> etc., etc. So don't play with this process. Use it the way it's given a hundred days. And don't tell me, I don't have time. Uh, come on. I made time in my life. You can do it somehow or other. I'm no extraordinary, special, different, or anything other than an ordinary human being. Huh? Not extraordinary in any way at all. But I made the best use of the faculties that I was given by nature. That's all. From the very earliest time of my life, I remember when I was three and a half years old, I was sitting in the church. It was Easter time. My family was very involved in the church and they were decorating, getting ready for Good Friday and Easter weekend. So they were putting plants, lilies, flowers, decorations all over the church, making it beautiful. Now, I was only three years old, <laughs> so what could I do? I just was sitting there in the pew, looking around the church at the stained glass windows. And of course, every Christian church with stained glass windows has this one window of Jesus in the garden, in the garden of Gethsemane, praying. So I was looking at this, it's a beautiful uh, picture. Jesus is kneeling and his hands are clasped, resting on a rock and the light is coming down on his face. And I suddenly realized he is talking with God, right? And the very next thought was, I can do that too. And you can do that too. Every human being can do it. Why? Because we are already connected with God. 
at least from God's side. <laughs> and if we think we're not, well, that's our illusion, that's our ignorance, that's all. It took me a long time to dissolve that ignorance, to get rid of, to see through, to obviate the duality. And here's how it happened. I'm going to tell this story. Now, I've told it many times before. It's also in my book on this subject. Uh, I was at home sitting. At that time, I was up to like 18 hours a day. You know, I wouldn't sit for a long time at a stretch. I would only sit for maybe half an hour because my legs have always gone to sleep. <laughs> and that's a distraction. So I would get up and walk around get the circulation moving again. And then I would sit again. So I would sit, get up, sit, get up. But as my concentration deepened, very interesting things started to happen within. I started seeing light. And the light took various forms. Always different. And never anything describable in words. Uh, but the energy was flowing inward and I wasn't doing it it was just happening after some time it becomes as the text states it becomes spontaneous it becomes natural so I was just sitting in that flow and digging it you know feeling really good and I had forgotten about everything I was just engaged in this inner experience, this wonderful, wonderful bliss. So one day I took a break. It was the 21st of December, 1984, the winter solstice. And I got up, made myself some ramen noodles. And uh, after eating, I was just wandering around my apartment. <laughs> I wasn't doing anything in particular, and I felt a presence, a, definitely a female presence. I mean, by this time, I had become so sensitive that I could feel the energy of everybody in the building. I lived in an apartment building. I think it was a three- or four-story apartment building with, I don't know, 20 or 30 apartments. Mine was one. And I could feel when people got up in the morning, when they went out to work, when they came home in the evening or for lunch. And I, I knew there was practically nobody in the building, maybe one or two people, that's all. So I was alone. The door was locked. The windows were locked. <laughs> but still, I had to look around the apartment because the feeling of somebody being there was so strong, so clear. And I was like, there isn't anybody here. What is this? And I remember I was, again, walking out of the kitchen toward my sitting place, looking out the window, which had a beautiful view of Portland Harbor and the bridge. And all of a sudden I felt like a tap right here, huh? like just like this, very gentle, loving tap on my forehead. And boom, all of a sudden I saw, what could I call it the ocean of milk. Huh? Just like I saw embedded in the normal reality a effulgence that penetrates everything. The air, the building, my body, the ground, trees, squirrels, birds. <laughs> Everything was penetrated by this energy, and it was conscious. It was alive. And I was in tune with it. I was part of it, connected with it. Oh, it was so beautiful. I was so blissed out. I just sat down and I went, wow. You know? <laughs> and I hadn't had any drugs in years. I used to take LSD, you know, I was a hippie in San Francisco in the summer of love, dude. But after uh, being in India for years as a sadhu, 
and then coming back and being connected with Osho, I wasn't taking anything, I wasn't doing anything for years. So this was not a hallucination. <laughs> this was real. And uh, I sat there, I don't know, for three or four hours, just blissing out to the max. It was incredible. And finally I said, wait a minute, I got to see whether this is, you know, like really real. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I thought maybe there was light coming out of my head or something. That's the way it felt. So I went down to the local tea shop. And when I got there, it's like all the plants in the windows were going, hello. <laughs> they were very aware of me. Uh, but the people were not. Now, this is the weird part. This is where it gets to Twilight Zone, okay? The people were like cardboard cutouts. They were like mannequins. They were like statues. They were so dead, dull. Huh? I mean, the, really, the stones and the wood were so much more alive than these people. I walked in there. Nobody even saw me. I was invisible. Talk about not acknowledging me. Uh, it's like I was not there for them. They were dead. So I said, well, this is weird. This never happened before. Usually when I walk into a place, you know, people look up and say, you know, check me out, whatever. This is, I was 39 years old, I think, at the time. But, uh, no, not a ripple, no, not a squeak, nothing. So I said, I'm going to test this. I'm going to see how far I can go. So I was standing in the back of the line, right? I went up to the front of the line, and I poured myself a cup of tea put honey and sugar, you know, in a little cup, and just calmly strolled out the door. Nobody said a word, nothing. I don't think anybody even looked at me. I was non-existent for them. This was really weird. So I'm going back to my place, still totally blissed out. <laughs> Going, what is this? What is going on? And that didn't affect the energy at all. It didn't affect my mood or the, the ecstasy I was feeling one bit. It's just like, oh well, I guess they're dead. You know? <laughs> but it was really like walking dead, you know, like a zombie movie. <laughs> Except they didn't attack me. They just, they couldn't even see me. It's like they weren't even alive. They were just machines. It was really a very strange moment. So anyway, I went back to my place and sat down and just blissed out for days. All it took was take one breath and concentrate in a certain way, turn around the light, and boom. It's still that way for me now. I don't over often see it like I did in that moment, but I sure can feel it all the time, anytime, no problem. So I guess I should say, do this process, reach the spontaneous level. Now it's really interesting, all the processes that I've ever done seriously, like bhakti, for example, one time, uh, you know, I was chanting, chanting mantras, Hare Krishna mantra, other mantras. One time, I went on a six-month chanting retreat, just myself, off in the woods in Hawaii, chanting on beads, at least eight hours a day. If you've ever done mantra meditation, you know, even one hour, imagine what it's like eight hours, and that was the minimum I was doing. And then I was doing more spontaneously. But I had taken a vow to chant 64 rounds. And I did for six months. Well, I can't even start to tell you 
the experiences I had. They're just indescribable. They're so beautiful, so wonderful. And it all came about because I didn't play around with this. Huh? The same with Buddhist meditation. When I was a Buddhist monk, I was meditating at least eight hours a day. Most of the time, more than that, 10, 12 hours. Because I wanted to understand, I wanted to really experience the Buddha's teaching. Now, I don't know anybody else who has done this kind of stuff, but it's very hard for me to understand why not. Do you think that you're going to transform your consciousness in one hour a day of practice? Come on. Even if you're like lifting weights or doing some other physical training, you're not going to transform yourself utterly in one hour a day. It's just not possible. What to speak of some psychological or spiritual transformation? It's just not going to happen. So you have to make some arrangement to where you are under the guidance of someone who is realized huh? so that you're lined up the right way, so that you're doing the process the right way. Get some feedback, get some instruction, get some support and help. And then you have to do enough of the process to actually change you. Huh? You know, there's this cartoon of somebody going, was speaking to a crowd, and he's going, who wants change? Everybody raises their hand, yeah, we want change. And then he goes, who wants to change? Nobody. Nobody raised their hands. So this is the reality. This is my experience, too. How many hours I have spent in front of this camera Trying to get people to do the process. Huh? I'd like to uh, actually get together with people who want to do the process. I'd love to, if I had the resources, provide an ashram where people could just come and stay and do this process. Huh? But I know what a mess that, that would probably turn out to be. So uh, I'm not asking for that anymore. <laughs> My reward would be if somebody would just do it and get the result. But it seems like everybody has so many prior commitments and obligations and misunderstandings and laziness and so many other obstacles, attachments, relationships, that they just can't find the time or can't bring themselves to do what's needed to get the result. So what are you all doing? Just watching these videos for entertainment? They're not very entertaining. I'm just sitting here talking at you. Talking head. So I don't know, you know. If you're watching this, you, you should be planning <laughs> to put it into action. Because I don't know how you could get these benefits in such a short time in any other way. Quite frankly. This is the process that brought me to the first stage of enlightenment, stream entry. And I'm sharing it with you because it works. And I can verify it. I can testify that it works. And I got the result. And you can too. It's very dramatic. You know, stream entry is the most dramatic of the four samadhis. And... Uh, I'm not going to say it was like um, celestial trumpets and choruses of angels, but, you know, it felt like that. It really did. <laughs> it felt like, you know, this is God. <laughs> and it was God. It is God. But not the kind of God that theology teaches. That's just a human construct. That's just a projection of human ego. But it's, it's the real God, the real birth of the soul. And that's the actual aim and result of the secret of the golden flower. <laughs>